Um, I'm a long talker, so I'm going to read from a script. I apologize, and uh, so I have to keep to it. So the unexamined exhibition of archaeological artifacts from the Holy Land offers a significant set of examples in curatorial decision making, in untold stories, in breaches of public trust, and bias in the contact zone. So many case studies from which to choose. Uh, we could be here all day or all week. And, but as I said, I'm a long talker, and in the end, I decided to just focus on one example of annexed artifacts and ex exhibitionary bias. But I've included some teasers because this is part of a larger project that I'm embarking on. Next year, I hope to be on leave, and this will be part of a project called Occupied Objects, where I look at objects that are currently, that were annexed or occupied and are displayed uncritically. Uh, so I have teasers in the PowerPoint, which you'll see. So before I turn to what I'm referring to as con curatorial conjecture, that is curators reifying the work of Nadia Abu al-Hajj by creating facts on the ground but in the museum, I'm going to set the stage regarding museums as contact zones, uh, or, um, situations around artifact annexation, and the actual term uh, holy land. So my use of the term Holy Land is deliberate. It's uh, it was and it continues to be a deliberate reflection of the geopolitical alighting of our current regional, of current regional states, which I believe results in an annexing of artifacts, an avoidance of issues related to territorial ownership uh, in places like Israel, Jordan, and Palestine. Those terms are applied inconsistently or not at all in museum exhibits related to objects and sites from the area. Instead, we get sanitized euphemisms like Land of Israel, the West Bank, the Levant, Judea, Samaria, the Holy Land. These are the preferred labels with museums presenting an apolitical stance. Reinforcing the, muse the, the universal, this all reinforces the universal museum concept of all for antiquities and antiquities for all. The material manifestations of the region speak to and belong to everyone. A museum's aversion to addressing these complex issues of geopolitics, provenance, ownership, and archaeological site destruction caused by looting brings about what I think is a distorted display, inaccurate interpretations of the material record, and injustice in the contact zone. While in this moment of decolonization, the trope of the museum as contact zone may appear dated, it does provide this really useful lens with which to scrutinize elements of public display. So as I mentioned, I'm in the early stages of developing some thinking around annexed artifacts and the museum as contact zone. And this is along the lines of Pratt, Clifford, and Boast. The Oxford Encyclopedia Dictionary defines annexation as the act of joining uh, the act of joining to uh, joining to add something to an additional part to uh, to an existing possession. The following is going to examine museum annexations of artifacts. Mary Louise Pratt developed the idea of the contact zone in the context of ch studying children who come together in a single classroom from different cultures, speaking different languages. She suggested that the classroom was the social space where cultures meet. They clash and they grapple with each other, often in the context of asymmetrical power relations and buttressed by uh, the legacies of colonialism and imperialism. Both James Clifford and Robin Boast have successfully and usefully co-opted Pratt's notion of the contact zone for the museum setting. It's handy for discussing exhibit interaction in order to explain the relationship between the visitor and the curator which can and does reinforce hierarchies of knowledge and oppression in the museum. Clifford proposes that the museum should be more than just a storehouse of colonial plunder or a one-way medium, but should in fact be a place of interactive communication, a space which benefits both the museum and the cultures whose artifacts it shows. And we can discuss this later because this is a perfect example. So Clifford imagined a museum as a more consultative space, displaying things not in isolation, but collaborating with host communities and sharing authority. And if you've seen this movie, you know that's not at all what's going on here. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
In his examination of the neo-colonial museum, Boast exposes the dark underside of the contact zone, where museums still retain the power in terms of what to collect, what to exhibit, and how to label and interpret what is on display. And I'm glad to follow both Liz Marlowe and Lucia Nixon because it sort of brings it all together as well. So inevitably, this results in bias in the contact zone. But I'd argue that there could be less bias and less structural injustice if museums were more intellectually honest and transparent in their display. So in selecting particular things for public display and choosing to tell only certain aspects of an object's biography results in the biased contact zone and in a thoroughly colonized situation and annexed artifacts. In examining museums and things from the Holy Land, it's become increasingly clear that while museums might aspire to embody the ideal contact zone, there are many instances where it appears that there's no shared authority, there may even be a complete disregard for transparency, and if consultation has taken place at all, it's only with particular groups, deliberately leaving out some voices and points of view. So the following is a case study in bias, in curatorial conjecture, in misleading maps, and in the annexation of artifacts. Between March and September of 2014, and I should preface this by saying, I gave a version of this paper, uh, this is my first case study that I pulled together, and I gave a version of this paper at the ASOR meetings in November. And some of you, I think, were there. Uh, this is, there is some overlap, but I would say that that was a theory light and less critical piece than this one. So um, it is substantially different. So between March and September of 2014, the Israel Museum displayed face-to-face -face the oldest masks in the world, which was the culmination of nearly a decade of research by Israel Museum curators and other archaeologists. The, exhibit, uh, the exhibition marked the first time that a group of masks from the pre-pottery Neolithic uh, B, which is from about 76,000 to 6,000 years ago, or BCE, sorry, was displayed together and the first time that the majority of the masks were available for public consumption. Opening to much fanfare, press coverage, the, the exhibition was launched to time, to time to coincide with the Jewish holiday of Purim. During that festival, it's customary to consume lots of alcohol, to celebrate in public, and to wear costumes and masks. At the, ex the exhibit opening, visitors were encouraged to stand behind the plexiglass display cases and have their pictures taken. At the opening, visitors were given masks to wear and selfies with the masks were the order of the day. The Israel Museum Facebook page asked the salient question, when was the last time you took a selfie with a 9,000 year old mask? The combination of exhibit lighting and the plexiglass cases created an inspired effect on the floor, in the center of the ring of masks, and on the ceiling. In my lifetime, I have visited hundreds of museum exhibits. I have rarely been to one so visually arresting, I will say. That is probably the only compliment I will give this exhibit, but um, it was truly visually very stunning. So of the 12 masks displayed together, 10 have no known associated archeological information. They are all on loan from a private collection, all purchased from the antiquities market. But all 12 masks are displayed together with nothing distinguishing the archeological from the market masks. You get 12 all together. This mask from the permanent collection of the Israel Museum was originally purchased by notorious antiquities collector, and thank you, Despina, for bringing this up, Moshe Dayan, right? Who in 1970 was the, at the time, Israel's Minister of Defense. After his death in 1981, William and Lawrence Tisch acquired the mask and donated it to the Israel Museum, where it's displayed in the prehistoric galleries and where it's known as the Dayan mask. It was unearthed by a Palestinian farmer plowing a field north of the West Bank village of El Hadeb near Hebron. It's notable in this map from the UK Daily Mail. And I know, I know that the UK Daily Mail is not our best source of information, but there are now people who looked at that unedited, because I've helped them out here, the unedited version, and think that the mask was found in Israel and that uh, Palestine does not even exist as a place. So 
Um, I, have, I use it to make that point. Uh, sorry, uh, so the, here the West Bank is actually labeled Israel. I uh, crossed that out and thus changing the geographical biography of the mask, which may have come, within, come from within the borders of Palestine. Later salvage excavations carried out by Palestinian archaeologist Jabril Schreer identified a site of over two and a half acres in size, which he dated to the pre-pottery Neolithic B. It's made of finely crystalline limestone covered by a gray patina. Now patina is, the compo is composed of calcareous deposits that form over time on the surface of objects that are buried in soil. And it's these microscopic microscopic components that might reveal whether the object is ancient and perhaps might shed light on the geographic origins of where the object was buried. Recent studies, uh, scientific studies and court cases related to Holy Land objects have proved that patina is not necessarily definitive proof of ancientness. We can also talk about the James Ossuary, which is a, fail, a case in failed patina. So the second mask in the permanent collection of the Israel Museum was discovered in the spring of 1983 by archaeologists Ofer Bar Yosef and David Alone, who excavated a cramped, dark, debris-filled cave overlooking the Dead Sea. The restorable mask fragments, which are pictured here, were recovered by the excavation team outside the cave in the back dirt pile, which was the result of earlier looting. People were looking for Dead Sea Scrolls and they were looting the cave and they dumped the mask. But David and Ofer found it, put it back together. So roughly life-size, the Nahal Himar mask is made of dolomitic life, uh, limestone and to date it's one of the largest Neolithic stone masks we found thus far. And the only example found at an archeological site. Far from any known uh, Neolithic settlement, the excavators surmised that the cave was a repository for ritual things, because we always say ritual when we can't explain things, right? Uh, where ceremonial activities were carried out rather than uh, habitation in this area. Based on the typology of lithics, in conjunction with radiocarbon dates, placed this mask firmly in the pre-pottery Neolithic B around 9,000 years ago. The remaining 10 masks included in the exhibit are all from the private collection of Michael and Judy Steinhardt, who might be more familiar to some of you as the owners of the $1.2 million gold fiale, which had to be returned to Italy when it was discovered that it was looted. There, was no rec recorded there is no recorded archaeological find spots for any of the masks in the Steinhardt collection, and the exhibit catalog and labels state simply, unknown sites. In an essay in the ex exhibition catalog, it speculates that at least three of the masks might have been discovered by famed members of the Bedouin Tamiri tribe, who also, by coincidence, discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. But we have no archaeological or archival evidence to support that claim. This curatorial conjecture ties the Steinharts to a very important historic moment and a connection to the land of the Bible slash Old Testament. This essay in a museum catalog placing the masks and the Dead Sea Scrolls in the same archaeological find spot vicinity adds to the folklore and aura surrounding the exhibition. According to the catalog and accompanying media hype surrounding the uh, display, the Steinharts agreed to, lo to lend their masks to the museum for the purposes of stylistic analysis of the similarities between their masks and the ones in the collection at the Israel Museum. But because 10 come from the antiquities market, uh, stylistic analysis is really the only thing we can do with these masks, is compare them stylistically. We have no concrete evidence that they're from the same time period, let alone the same site. And yet, in almost 10 years of scientific analysis by Yuval Gorn, who is an expert in comparative microarchaeology at Ben Gurion University, and coincidentally, the ex an excavator, a student excavator with Bar Yosef at the Nahal Himar cave, he did uh, analysis on the masks and he presented some interesting results in the exhibition catalog and in the exhibit itself. He declared that the masks in the Israel Museum collection, the Diane mask and the Nahal Himar mask, are authentic, which is not at all surprising since as one was recovered from a looter's back dirt pile, and the other, although purchased by Diane, had a confirmed fine spot from the Hebron farmer. So that's not surprising. 
He also concluded that the masks from the Steinhardt collection are also authentic and originate from three possible locations, the Judean hills, the Judean foothills, and the Judean desert fringe. He went on to suggest that five of the Steinhardt masks and the Diane mask are probably all from the same assemblage, based on their similar construction, their patina, and their style. Thank you. But without, you all know, without an archaeological find spot, this is both scientific and curatorial conjecture, right? Even though in his catalog essay, Gorin admits it cannot be proved that this entire set of masks was found in one spot, at one site, or at the same time. Theoretically, the masks could have been brought to the antiquities market from multiple sites, from multiple looting episodes. That's not what gets presented in the map. This map from the exhibit catalog provides possible find spots for the undocumented things owned by the Steinharts, misleading in that only systematic archeological excavations would provide the necessary contextual evidence to state exactly where they originate from, and if a cache of five masks existed in antiquity. Additionally, the use of terms like Judean hills, Judean foothills, and Judean desert intentionally conflates the current geopolitical boundaries of Palestine and Israel. The findings from the archeologist slash scientist have resulted in a number of facts that may or may not be scientifically or archeologically verifiable. In the didactic material, the labels, the text panels, and the catalog associated with the exhibit, there was little or no discussion about the acquisition of the artifacts in the market or the undocumented nature of 10 of the masks. Before its public debut at the Israel Museum in 2014, on June 8, 2012, mask number eight, the watching mask, was offered at, at a Christie's auction for an estimated four to $600,000. The mask was cataloged as coming from a New York private collection. Whether or not it's the Steinharts who were the consigners is unclear, and there is actually no record of the sale of this mask. But in the ex exhibition catalog is an image from the Steinhardt's home library, which shows the mask, number eight, below a Picasso. Throughout the catalog and the exhibition, there was much acknowledgement of the generosity and kindness of the Steinhardt's and their loan, but no mention of how demand for archaeological things like this mask can and does lead to this looting at a Neolithic site like this at Wadi al Patafi in Jordan. Okay, but first, now I have to say, please do not get me wrong, we have never found a mask like this at Wadi Katafi, although that would be pretty sweet. Uh, we do have a lot of looting from the site. Um, by exhibiting documented and undocumented masks in the same space, by providing scientific imprimatur of a creative fine spot and a fictional narrative about a cache of masks, the Israel Museum has added to the market value of these pieces, should the Steinharts to sell, decide to donate or sell their masks in the future. In a discussion with the exhibition curator, Debbie Hirschman, she mentions that there are three types of visitors to the exhibit. Those who spend five minutes, those who spend 10, and those who spend an hour or more. In a day spent conducting participant observation, I can confirm that this, this, is, this in fact was the pattern of visitors. Which made me wonder, if the average visitor only spends 10 minutes, would they even see or read a label or a text panel about these sticky questions about where the artifacts come from, who owns them, should they be on display, are they embroiled in controversy, is there any missing information? Looking at the exhibit map, does the viewer understand that the five masks depicted as found in the same spot is actual conjecture based on evidence from patina? Even if the answer to all of these questions is a resounding no, I think it's the museum's duty to reveal the exhibitionary bias related to these difficult questions and controversies surrounding these objects that they chose to display. Museums aren't neutral spaces, and ostensibly innocent exhibitions are often embroiled in problematic backstories of which the public is frequently unaware, which can and does lead to bias in the contact zone. But ultimately, it's the museum's responsibility to acknowledge and address these biases. Thank you.